Okay. Um, good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, uh, dialing in to today's Cyber Infrastructure Brown Bag. Um, today, we're going to hear from Adam Monroe from the University of Virginia. Um, he's going to talk about some stateless node management at UVA using open source software services. Um, just a quick reminder, if you could type your questions into the chat window, um, and uh, we'll collect those and we'll do uh, questions at the end. Um, so, Ian, thanks very much for, for coming today, and uh, Adam, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, so before we get started, I'd just like to thank uh, Jason Zorowski for organizing these cyber infrastructure talks and uh, to Eli for helping get, get us going today. Um, these talks have been proven to be very valuable for us at UVA in terms of developing, validating, and challenging our own processes, and I hope you have found that uh, beneficial as well. I'd also like to thank you all for joining us today, especially if you're connecting from Florida Atlantic University, uh, South Florida, or Central Florida, or any other location impacted by Irma. Uh, I hope you and your family are safe and well. Um, since megastorms have been so dominant in the news lately, I thought I might get to start by talking about how our perception and understanding of a system can actually limit how we deal with it. Um, for example, we're all familiar with the Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3, Cat 4, Cat 5 classifications of hurricanes, more formally known as the Saffir-Simpson scale, not to be confused with RJ45 cables. The scale is a fairly modern one, having been developed by civil engineer Herbert Saffir and meteorologist Robert Simpson a few years before basically becoming standard, I guess, in the United States in 1974. Um, for, I think it was replacing the Beaufort scale, which had been developed back as back in the early 1800s. So anyway, the Saffir Simpson scale can be described in terms of wind speed, but the intended design of the scale was to measure the potential damage of a hurricane to human-made structures. And so you'll notice when you look at it that the wind speed ranges between the different categories don't seem to really follow any formal mathematical function, uh, at least not as far as I could tell. Uh, you have an 18 mile per hour range at category one, 12 at category two, 16 at three, 23 at four, and this next one's important, infinity miles per hour at category five. Uh, of course, we can use the laws of physics to help significantly narrow things down, but what an actual definition is, sustained one minute wind speeds of over 137 miles per hour. There's no maximum. Um, back in 2006, there was an interview with Robert Simpson where he was asked about having a category six rating, and he said, when you get up into winds in excess of 155 miles per hour, you have enough damage that that extreme wind sustains itself for as much as six seconds on a building, it's going to cause rupture and damages that are serious no matter how well it's engineered. According to some reports, Irma hit Barbuda with wind speeds of up to 185 miles per hour, or to put it another way, by winds 48 miles per hour faster than they needed to be in order for Irma to be classified as Category 5 hurricane. It might be interesting to point out that if you were to take any Category 1 hurricane and give it a 48 mile per hour boost, it would become a Category 4. Now, this was an absolutely devastating storm, uh, especially for Barbuda. And as you can see from this hopefully legitimate image, but one thing you might notice from the image is that in spite of the maximum rating, in spite of the wind speeds in excess of 155 miles per hour, which remember was Simpson's implied cutoff range for absolute devastation, the damage to the human-made structures on the island wasn't 100%. At least some structures survived the storm. So let's look at another weather system that might also be classified as Category 5. So, so this storm, uh, the Great Eye of Jupiter, with the relative size of Earth superimposed on top of it to illustrate that the circumference of the storm is greater than that of the Earth, um, easily produces wind speeds of over 380 miles per hour, or about 230 miles per hour faster than the wind speeds reported on Barbuda. If you were to take Barbuda, the, the whole island off of the earth and hold it into that storm for six seconds before pulling it out and gently placing whatever's left back on the earth, what do you think the end result would look like? Just the ocean. Um, so the point I'm trying to make with all this is that, especially in our current age and industry of great accelerations, an established system or way of doing things, even one that is relatively new and modern, should continuously be tested against the extreme and impossible cases, just to see if it can still handle the not so impossible tomorrow challenges of accelerated change, or if a different way of doing things is required. Um, the model we have and we use at EVA uh, was developed and continues to be updated in consideration of the most extreme cases that we could think of in terms of scaling up. 
involves working with a minimal amount of resources. It is certainly not perfect. It won't be able to save you from Jupiter, and I'm sure that places like TAC are doing something better. But hopefully some of what we're doing and why we're doing it will make sense and at least give some ideas that you'll find useful managing your own environments. Um, so with that said, let's talk about stateless computing. Um, this is the uh, UVA's first contribution to these talks, and I believe it is something that we do pretty well at UVA. And again, I hope it will be of interest or benefit to you. Um, basically, we're managing a fairly large set of stateless infrastructure using a motley of services that you can find freely available with CentOS or Red Hat if you're fortunate enough to have a site license with them. To try to avoid past mistakes that I've made when trying and failing to describe what it is that we're doing, I'd just like to clarify the stateless nature of our environment is defined by the fact that over 99% of our nodes use a local, sorry, use a non-local read-only boot source. The operating systems that they use, they get, well, to greatly simplify it, they, they get it through the network. Um, and I chose this subject because whenever I go to conferences and talk to peers, talk to you from different sites, I'm often surprised by how many locations still aren't doing what we're doing, or at least are doing it, or early, early doing it as part of some uh, Bundle, vendor ba uh, bundle package of proprietary services, which are generally incompatible with you know, general purpose hardware to buy this product or this product. Um, and when I ask what they're doing, I hear about scaling problems, uh, content management systems not being able to keep up, long downtimes to make uh, major software upgrades, ITEL compatibility struggles. Um, some of you are facing the compliance issues with ITEL, and a host of other issues that at UVA, in our, our team, we regard with about as much concern as you would about getting the bubonic plague. Um, of course, I say this betting that none of you fall into the set of 600 or so cases that are reported every year. Um, but why? Why is this the case? Is it because I'm not talking to enough people at supercomputing? That's, that's possible. <laughs> I'm generally an introvert who naturally seeks darkness and avoids people whenever possible. Is it because my peers know that just like the golfers pictured here, what we're doing is doomed to fail, and they're just not bothering to tell me about it because they find the idea of our inevitable failure amusing? I hope not. Like it'd be so hard for them to say, hey, Bill, that was an excellent swing. Hey, did you notice the wildfire? Or else we should get out of here and try to bring course. But that's also possible. Um, I, I can be foolish at times and forget to write that, uh, forget to ask the right questions. But I hope it's either the first reason or it's because that the people who are doing it similar to how we're doing it haven't really gotten the chance to communicate it. Um, and it probably doesn't help that outside of, I guess, Bright Computing, I don't know of any vendor who would recommend this approach. And even with Bright, they probably wouldn't tell you to do it yourself. So during this talk, we'll start by discussing all the relevant problems that we at University of Virginia don't have to deal with because of our model. Then we'll go through a brief overview of the services that we're using, which are all open source, and I think you're, generally speaking, you're probably all pretty familiar with them on their own, uh, and how we have them configured. Next, I'll talk about how we have those services deployed and interacting with each other in our environment. Um, then we'll circle back to the list of problems that we don't worry about, but this time I'll explain why. And to wrap things up, I was hoping we can use the remainder of the time for questions and discussion. I'd love to know if anyone else, like any of you, are doing the same thing that we're doing, or if you've considered it and you're willing to talk about why you decided to take a different direction, why you decided to take a different approach. Okay, so first up, uh, the problems we don't worry about. Um, so what are the HPC system administration problems that we don't worry about at UVA? This was actually a hard section to work on because by definition, we don't usually worry about these things but I did manage to come up with at least eight. Uh, starting with, number one, adding a clump of 100 new nodes into an existing system in under half an hour after physical delivery day one. We basically just need to have the machines configured to Pixie Boot and get the list of MAC addresses for their network boot interfaces in advance of delivery. If we have all that, the new nodes can immediately start running science codes after they boot. I practice, of course, we test them before subjecting our researchers to them, but in theory, we don't have to. Um, we, would, we would anyway. Number two, 100% complete backup out of any major software change within half an hour. If the retreat order has been received, we simply reboot all the nodes. Uh, and the time it takes them to power back on, they've been completely, 100% reverted to what they were in the pre-change state. Uh, this is great uh, for reasons that we'll get into later, but the truth is we never need to exercise this option because of number three, 
We have 99% confidence in the success of any major software change prior to making the change. The only reason this isn't 100% is because there are certain types of tests that we cannot perform without having 100% of the system to test with. Um, that said, we do go in with pretty good confidence. Uh, number four, licensing costs. Um, just to clarify, I'd love to have a site license for Red Hat. Um, maybe we'll get one in the near future. But in truth, we aren't using anything that isn't already freely available. And for the most part, isn't anything that isn't available as a regular uh, CentOS RPM package. Um, number five, debugging any strange software behavior that only manifests on a particular node or subset of nodes. In every case, and even before looking into the problem, we know that it's due to a hardware issue, or either specific to a single node, or a specific set of nodes that have, the, you know, have an identical set of hardware. Uh, number six, any major service failure, like Slurm, as the result of a single node failure. Um, if anyone doesn't believe me on this, I'd be happy to demonstrate an attempt to turn off our scheduler service, the production one, just to show you what happens. Just to be clear, I'm not going to do that. Um, I know it'll be fine. I have nothing to prove to you, but anyway. Um, and number seven, virtually all security vulnerabilities, including root exploits. Uh, we do worry about the root account being used to steal or destroy science data, but we don't worry about the root account being used to do something like replace SSHD with a version that does key logging or to sneak in an evil root owned set UID binary onto the operating system. And then number eight, finally, playing nice with ITIL. Um, change requests are hilariously easy for us to write. Uh, we don't even have to resort to using BS or using um, canned copy, co copy and pasting canned content that sounds good but doesn't really mean anything. No, we copy and paste canned content that sounds good and is actually meaningful to the request. So, um, so next, services. Um, for pretty much everyone here, I think this next part will be a review of services that you already know very well. Um, however, when we get to the discussion stage of the talk, and if you'd like me to talk into detail or demonstrate any particular one of them, uh, please let me know. Um, I think it's worth going over them all uh, before getting to how they combine into a mighty whole like our friend of humanity pictured here, the Decepticon Devastator during a construction con combination. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, boot control services. So unless you're managing a very, very small environment, you are probably using DHCP in some manner to configure your network interfaces. A lot of you are also probably fortunate enough to have the level of access required to reconfigure your DHCP service using a for loop and a text file consisting of host names, MAC addresses, and IP addresses. Um, I'm guessing you probably also use your Etsy host file for name resolutions because it's the easiest way to deal with that on multi-home nodes, such as, you know, for example, compute nodes that have multiple interconnects, um, like, you know, the min network, InfiniBand, et cetera. That's how we do it anyway. And the same for loop using the same text file used to update dhcpd.com can also be used to update Etsy hosts. Uh, finally, and unless you're using your network um, to boot or boot install the nodes, um, you could be using TFTPD, uh, TFTP boot to direct your nodes to start a net install or boot from an NFS volume. Again, same for loop, same text file with an additional row entry perhaps to define what directed file, pixie boot directed file. You want the hex IP labeled symlink under your um, TFTP boot pixie like pixie um, directory to point to. Um, draft cut. Uh, draft cut is awesome. Uh, Drag code is what we're using to create initRD files, which include a custom set of modules that we define. Uh, for example, network drivers, specific network drivers. Uh, in spite of me not having much else to say about it, Drag that's one of my favorites in this list. And if there's only one thing um, that's new to you, if this is new to you, and you look into after this talk, um, I, I think you'd find Drag pretty beneficial. Um, DRBD, PCSD, and NFSD. Uh, DRVD is, uh, you may have, may have, may not have used it. This is, this is the only thing listed here and the only thing that we use that I, I don't know if you can just do an RPM install of, like you have to actually download the source and build it. Um, and there are different solutions you could be using for it, but we're using DRVD, so I'm mentioning DRVD. Um, this is the thing that allows you to take identical volume sizes across multiple servers, um, all connected to the same network, and have it so that each node has a block copy, identical block copy of the file system, the same data, but only one of the nodes in the set has the volume mounted. 
That's exactly how we're using it. Um, PCSD is a combination of popular high availability technologies like Pacemaker and CoroSync. Uh, we have these configured to keep various instances of different service sets. We don't use them everywhere. We actually use them only for a small set of stuff. But anyway, um, various instances of different service sets aliased by a single IP so that they can continue running without service disruption. Uh, one example would be the combination of DRVD, so that you have uh, one of two machines with the file system mounted, but it's identical on the other, the other file system. MariaDB uh, running with the database on that file system. Slurm DVD with all the, um, the Slurm accounting database, database again running on that file system. And Slurm CTLD with the, um, the school files for the jobs also located on that file system. And then you just add in a floating IP that could jump between the two machines and alias that to scheduler. Uh, User-facing volumes that we export by NFSD are exported read-only. Um, it's kind of deceptive to call them user-facing volumes. Um, probably OS volumes should be a better, better way of saying it. Um, so next, Etsy RW tab and Etsy sysconfig read-only root. It was a huge surprise to me when I found out just how long these files have been there. Um, apparently, they've been there since CentOS 5. But we only started using them when we got to three, uh, seven three. Uh, these simple configuration files are used to warn the operating system that the read-only file system will not be writable, and to tell it what stuff needs to go into RAM during the boot process. Even without doing the vast majority of what we do, um, even if booting off local disk, there's some real temptation in making use of this. Nothing that could compete with RAM when it comes to I/O, except for L1, L2 cache. But there's not enough of that to use um, to us. Postgres. Um, hopefully this does not come as a huge surprise, but we do not have a single text file that defines the whole configuration of our entire environment. Uh, we used to, but it just started taking too long for our impact printer to produce the backups. No one could remember the combination of the safe where we stuck all that paper copy into. No, we use Postgres. Um, the schema that we use isn't terribly complicated, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over it. We can go over it during the discussion if you'd like. Um, anyway, you don't need to know much about SQL to determine how to create a table with a column named IP, which only allows unique non-null values matching the regular expression digit dot digit dot digit dot digit for each digit falls between 0 and 255. It's also not hard to determine why that would be very, very useful. Okay, so those are all the services. Maybe you're kind of getting an idea of how we're doing it, but let's get into how we're actually doing it, how the UVA, what the UVA deployment looks like. Um, so let's talk about how we're using those services at UVA to drive our environment. Our main system, the layout for which has been crammed into the image that you can see, consists of roughly 400 or so machines. Only four of those have a locally installed operating system. The four machines that get an operating system, we call image servers, are split into two pairs and are configured to run DRVD, uh, PCSD, TFTPD, and NFSD. So as to offer two different access points into the same service, Everything else in the environment, every other machine uses one of the two service access points uh, to load their OS through the network. Although the image servers are running uh, DHCP D and TFTP D, they're only doing that for two other hosts in the entire environment. Uh, these hosts that we call directors, uh, after they boot, they start up PCSD, uh, configured for load balancing in their case, DHCP D and TFTP D. And that's so that the load of all the services, like the, the load of the other, you know, the load of the vast majority of the 400 nodes aren't all being um, pushed onto the, the most important image servers that be pushed onto these two director nodes. Um, yeah, so they also, sorry, they also do serve as gateways into the environment and out of the environment, um, which is an unfortunate thing and hopefully it's, unique to our situation and not yours. Um, it would be far better to have our core network switch directly connected, but our network group doesn't own our equipment. They don't want to own our equipment, and it, you know, they definitely don't want us to connect our networking equipment into their networking equipment. Um, other host of interest. Uh, this network layout is a bit out of date, but it's good for illustrating what our HP administration network looks like. So we have four nodes running to scheduler services. Uh, they have local disks, but they only use those to store staple information used by Slurm CTLD and Slurm DVD. Um, just to be clear, there's only one main scheduler in our environment. The other one is usually running a newer version of the scheduler in an operating system and only schedules jobs for a small subset of the environment. We have two nodes running one database service. Uh, these nodes also have local disks, but they only use that to store our configuration management database. 
Uh, we have six nodes, only four of them pictured here, which are running six interactive services. These are our only user entry points into the system. Everything else is running a compute service. Some of these are different in the side to our test environment, but the vast majority are in the And if we completely lost power to our data center, which should be impossible, but actually happened once, so I can honestly say this, it would take about five minutes for the image servers to boot, another five minutes for the director nodes, and about another 10 minutes for everything else. I don't think it would take 15 minutes for our core IP switch to boot, but in any case, we're probably going to be within half an hour. In terms of networking, our HP CAM, or High Performance Computing Administration Network, again, pictured here, has a 10G core switch with 10G links into a few dozen top of the rack switches. Also connected to the core switch, we have the major infrastructure nodes like image servers, database servers, and schedulers. Our interactive and director nodes have 10G connections into the greater UVA campus network, with the interactor nodes mainly using those for researcher requests, and the directors mainly using them to access research uh, external storage locations. Uh, Enterprise IT NAS, for example. In summary, what this means in our environment, everything that you see in the pie chart above, excluding the tiny blue slides representing our image servers, does not have an operating system installed. Most of the nodes don't even have local disk. What they do have is a solid network connection to an operating system that they can and do boot off. And also, at any given time, there's only one folder being hosted by the image servers that all of our compute nodes share as the root file system. Just one. It's read only, so they can share it. Our stateless nodes boot from a common read only source and use their own memory for stateful data where it is needed. Or in the case of the scheduler and database services where we want the services to remember things after a, a reboot or a failover, they use local disk. So, unlike the Androids and HBO's Westwood, our nodes can be fairly quickly repurposed with no memory or trace whatsoever of what they used to be doing in their previous lives simply by rebooting them and updating their pixie files to point to a different location. Um, you might be wondering where we get the NFS root folders from. If not, I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, we have a bunch of VMs running and managed by Poppets, uh, which are using enterprise, ID, uh, enterprise IT blessed uh, methods that we otherwise don't pay that much attention to. We take the build, um, update it a bit to make it HPC, uh, like you know, adding OFED, um, Lustre clients, things like that, are sync the applicable parts of the root file system on the VM into a different folder, then tar that off, copy it over the image servers. If we need to, we also use DrawCut and SCP to copy over the applicable initRD and VMLinux.tft files. So just a diagram to illustrate the role of Puppet and enterprise IT virtual machines. In this particular example, the public rule is being applied over compute nodes, but we can use different rules for different roles to build a different type of NFS root folder. Um, for example, we could build one specifically for schedulers or um, once for an OpenStack controller, whatever, whatever we need. Um, shortly after extracting the new folder on the image servers, and if we have to, if we need to, um, adding to the list of kernels supported by TFTP boot by adding the other files created by DrawCut, we can begin testing the new folder by picking any idle compute node, drain it if you have to, um, and just reboot it. Point it to the new kernel, uh, point it to the new folder, and it's something completely different than what it was before. So this is bringing us back to the problems we don't worry about. Um, except having gone through the last two sections, we have a lot more context that can be used to help answer the questions of why and how, or how and why. So the first thing, adding a club of 100 new nodes into the existing system in under half an hour after physical delivery and cabling. We're not worried about adding 100 new nodes into the existing system in under an hour after physical delivery and cabling because, well, in advance of delivery, we will have added these to our database, which afterwards will have been queried by our director nodes so that they be added to our dhpd.com uh, uh, file. Uh, there will be pixie boot entries automatically generated for them. Um, and they would have been also, the same database would have been queried by our scheduler nodes to update partitions uh, and nodes so that the scheduler knows about them before they even come on. So once we power the new nodes on, minus the time it takes them to boot, they'll be available as new compute nodes. I mean, for this specific case, and this specific example of using compute nodes. 100% complete backload out of many major change within half an hour. We know that we can do this because now, we know that we can do 100% do this because any change within an hour, because when we upgrade the older hosts, we're not modifying the boot sources at all, not their at-the-moment boot sources. 
within the DRVD partition of the image server, we have different folders, and I can I can show you guys this later if you want. Um, and they're named things like uh, compute June 2017 and scheduler July 2017, etc. And so when we upgrade the system, there's always at least two folders with similar names. Uh, so if our last update was in March and our next update is scheduled for October, you might see two folders, uh, one called Compute March 2017 and one called Compute October 2017. Um, so you see, we don't update the operating system at all. We just tell the nodes to do it using a different boot source, which happens to contain updated material. And this sort of leads into why we have such high confidence going into changes. Um, we have like 99% complete confidence in the success of any major software change prior to the change because we know in advance, uh, going back to the previous example, for example, like uh, the Compute October 2017 folder, we will have known that that folder will work with every variation of hardware that we have because at least one of every variation of hardware that we have will have been pulled into the test environment um, for just about as long as it has been since our last change using that new folder. Um, so the only thing we don't know for sure is the only thing we cannot really test is like behavior and performance of very large MPI uh, codes. Um, we can to some extent, but you know, you want the cluster available for research computing, not for testing the future of research computing, so you don't get to play with a whole thing. Uh, licensing costs. We have a scalable model that doesn't use any license software, and it isn't locked to any particular hardware vendor. Um, oh, this, this is a great one for, uh, yeah, uh, debugging any strange software behavior that only manifests on a particular node or subset of nodes. So you get to rule out a lot of stuff when your nodes are booting using identical read-only operating systems. If, if there's a problem, you can absolutely assert that the libraries, the kernel, uh, service configurations, et cetera, have not been changed. They can't be. The operating system is read-only, and the read-only state is being enforced by the NFS server, which is exploring the volume that's read-only. So you know, when you don't have to worry about the operating system uniquely changing on a single node under any circumstances, you save a lot of time troubleshooting. And it also gives your researchers uh, a very stable and consistent environment. Also makes writing health checks easier. Um, any major service failure. Um, one of the valid criticisms of using, using NFS root and stateless nodes is the dependency that it introduces between the client and the server. Now, we've already talked about how PCSD and other technologies are being used to ensure that the average of any single node doesn't take the entire system down. But we haven't talked about what it means if the clients are themselves running high availability services, which are just itching to kill each other at the slightest sign of weakness. Um, this is the main reason why we have two pairs of image servers, so that the other stateless high availability pairs don't both depend on the same boot source. Um, since we introduced this setup, we haven't had a single unplanned outage of any of our infrastructure servers. Um, and let's go through the last two quickly. Uh, we're not usually too worried about security for the same reasons we're not worried about the operating system changing on us. And we can play nice with ITEL because the major pain points of the change process, um, testing, backup, uh, which in our case includes the central IT's production release standard build, um, all that stuff's already covered. Um, so that's it for the main talk. I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions about what we're doing and see if we can get some discussion going there. I also have questions for you. Um, are we at UVA just kidding ourselves? Is there something horrible and time bomb like about what we're doing that we'll eventually counter and we've just failed to notice it by not asking the right questions? Um, are you doing something better? And would you be willing to say a few words about it to the community? So, uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, anybody have questions, please uh, type them in. Ah, okay, so here's one. Um, so why do you choose um, a DRVD back storage instead of an NFS appliance like uh, Cumulo or something like that? It got grandfathered in. Um, if I had to do it today, I'd probably use GFS. Um, when we, when we, when the equipment was like for right Bannon's huge large component, like the initial uh, cluster when it was purchased, it was purchased with a vendor solution on it that made use of of DRVD. Heartbeat in that case, and also a similar type of technology. So, you know, all the config files were already there, um, building some processes around it. So, okay, let's use it. You know, um, haven't had any problems with it. Understand how to debug it pretty well. 
Um, but I think, you know, part of that constantly reassessing, constantly going back and looking for something better, um, it could just as easily be replaced, especially since support on it is not as strong as some of these other things that are out there with something that you replace. Okay. Um, so I had one as well. Um, which is, uh, so, I mean, you talked about how the operating system is managed. Um, how do you deal with, um, user accounts? Are there literally just no, I mean, do, do, does that come down as, as part of the, um, is any infrastructure come down for that as part of the boot process? Um, is that as part of the read only route? Um, how, how does that integrate with, with this sort of stateless config? It is not part of read only root. Can everybody see the terminal here? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Okay. So um, this, this goes back to whether or not you should use a huge, and that's why I made the joke about it being such a large file, like a huge text flat file containing the entire configuration of the entire environment or using a database. Um, depending on how you're setting up things, you might have a division of resources where you don't want certain people accessing certain machines. Um, so, I think every site should do their own variation of this, but in our case, I have to pick the right host name. Um, uh, we use something that, that uh, takes uh, user accounts, um, groups, and machines, mainly those three things, and, and um, defines associations between them, like in a relational database, so that um, our user accounts, like if, if you're on a node and that account, like if that machine has been assigned to queue serial, right? And so that queue serial, for example, let's look at the parallel queue. P -A -R -A -L -Q. So this is our parallel queue. Um, um, and everybody see this? Okay. Anyway, um, the list here is just these are the resources that have been allocated to the parallel queue in terms of compute nodes. That's the web direction. So you start with a, with a group, which is called well, type Q, which is called parallel. On one side associations, we have all these machines. On the other side of the associations, we have all these users. So the users are members of the group. The machines are the members of the group. And so having to find that relationship between the two things, uh, when you want to do something like uh, uh, see, password, uh, create a password file, um, all it is is a simple query. It just sort of looks it up. It's like, okay, based on this machine that I'm on right now, what account should I see? And I'm sorry, actually, come to think of it, you might be asking the question in the context of the fact that a lot of people will use Etsy password, uh, which is pretty normal. We, we have two password files and two root files. The one Etsy password file is the system Etsy password file. That is real. We don't touch that. Um, we, we leave that completely alone. But we also have Etsy files plus password, sorry, let's see files plus. And within here we have a group of password file. Um, if you wanna do this in your own environment, it's actually pretty handy um, to separate the two. And I'd be happy to show how, um, if anyone's interested. But yeah, see there's, there's that files plus part of password. So files and then files plus, files and then files plus. So that way you can keep the static password file without having to worry about that being modified. But you can also be dynamic in terms of what accounts you want to allow access to that particular system. Does that answer your question? Yep, that makes sense. Okay. Other questions? Is anybody else doing this or is doing something similar? You know, I've, I've certainly cer certainly heard of people doing, um, you know, using CF Engine and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the ESNet for Sonar hosts are, are uh, managed with CF Engine. Currently, we're actually transitioning to Ansible. Um, right, do you have those as stateless though? I just not. I did I just built one. It was like on disk though. No, no, the ours ours are ours are not are not stateless. Yeah. Um, and this is actually it, it's it's interesting to see uh, to look at managing persona nodes in this way um, yeah I, I thought about doing like we uh, as i said we just built our first persona node and i'm debating whether or not i probably will is, is just to take that same just treat it like um one of our vms that has been built with a standard image and just you know doing a copy root fs essentially of that thing into a folder and then seeing how it would behave like a um, 
you know, as any other stateless client. We're already doing that with our data transfer node, like the one on running Globus. It's, it doesn't have an OS and so on. It's just using its disks as a ZFS volume for, uh, well, fast buffering. Right, right. Yeah, I guess in, in the first sonar case, you'd want to make sure to write results out to a, to a non-local measurement archive, but other than that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, other questions from uh, other participants? Anybody else doing stuff like this for your own clusters? No one, really. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what are we doing wrong? <laughs> Anyone? Uh, sounds reasonable to me, but uh... okay. Um, All right. Well, well um, I guess if that's all, um, I'd like again to say. Um, Thank you very much, um, Adam, for, for talking about this. I think it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, let's see, for next week, um, Andy Lake and uh, Mark Fate are gonna be giving a uh, talk on Personar. So the Persona is the Persona development teams look ahead at changes coming to Personar software over the next few releases. So some tools enhancements, um, sort of roadmap, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's an opportunity to learn more um, about what they're doing and ask questions um, and provide input on the next version of, uh, of Personar. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all very much for, for being part of this today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye all.